This is a recording of Ken Buck's talk at the Science of Consciousness Conference in Tucson, Arizona, USA, on 29th April 2016. The title of the talk was Computational Aspects of the Overflow Model of Consciousness. Now, one of the most salient constraints on the evolution of biological systems is that there's an abundance of sensory data coming from the environment, but the cognitive capacity of biological systems is simply not sufficient to handle all of them. Take a look at this honeybee sucking nectar from the flower of uh, Sahara cactus in Tucson captured on my iPhone. If you take a look at this honeybee, there's a abundance of sensory information coming from the environment conveying biologically relevant information on food, predator, potential mate, and competitor. In addition, they convey information about environment such as light, temperature, and precipitation, which is, by the way, quite unlikely to happen here in Tucson. So the physical overflow can be defined as sensory data minus quantity capacity, O equals S minus C. The overflow theory of the evolution of consciousness states that overflow has been a common denominator from a single cell to a brain in terms of the evolution of the structure, function, and consciousness of these biological systems. So, physical overflow exists, but how about phenomenological overflow? Well, it is controversial, to say the least. The fact is that the metacognition of phenomenological properties of experience is quite different among subjects. I found that there is a positive correlation between the awareness of qualia and knowledge in cognitive science, so that the more a subject knew about the cognitive science, the more likely he or she is aware of qualia. I also found that there was a positive correlation between belief in free will and belief in paranormal phenomena, so that the more a subject believed in paranormal phenomena such as UFO and reincarnation, the more he or she would tend to believe in the existence of free will. I asked the subjects if the vision was like A with that overflow or B with overflow. The opinions were divided among subjects, with about half of the subjects answering the vision was like A, with that overflow, while the other half answered the vision was like B, with overflow. I asked the subject if the conscious vision felt like the refrigerator illusion in which you feel as if you are seeing all these things, but they are just illusory. Again, the opinions were divided, with half of the subjects agreeing with the idea of refrigerator illusion, for the other half did not agree with the idea of refrigerator illusion. So conventionally, we regarded the theorizing of consciousness like empirical evidence and then applied rejection, and we have a convergent theory, a single correct theory of consciousness, right? However, what is actually happening seems to be that the metacognition of one's own phenomenal experience is actually quite heterogeneous among subjects, so that they have different intuition about one's own conscious state, so that there's not a convergence of theory of consciousness. Even among experts, opinions differ about the nature or even the existence of phenomenological overflow. So it's quite difficult to come to an agreement about phenomenological overflow. But let us assume here, for the sake of argument, that phenomenological overflow actually exists. What, if any, is the function of significance? Here's a chopper flying over the trees, and you experience all these greens and blues and choppers. Now, in terms of cognition, it'll be perceived like this, a chopper flying between two chunks of green. So cognition is about this perception. And if you take a look at the video very carefully, you realize that the positions of the greens are different in earlier frames and in later frames. So cognition is actually this perception in the spatial temporal domain. So cognition is about this perception, and cognition is used for making judgments and taking appropriate actions. But what about the phenomenological overflow? If the majority of its information do not enter cognition, then what use is it? What is the function of significance? In other words, where does it all go? Well, here I am putting for the hypothesis that the phenomenological overflow is actually very tightly coupled with embodiment. Yeah, you heard it right, embodiment. 
This is kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? Because we tend to think that embodiment or embodied cognition is unconscious, whereas phenomenological overflow is the epitome of phenomenological consciousness. So they seem to be world apart. How come they are related? Well, I will explain. So we have sensory overflow, and only a part of it, a small part of it, enters cognition. So some people argue that there's no sense uh, in discussing the functional significance of sensory overflow. However, I'm arguing here that the sensory overflow is tightly coupled with embodiment so that it does have significant functionality in biological systems. Physical overflow equals sensory data minus cognitive capacity, and it goes to embodiment. That's my argument. O equals S minus C goes to embodiment. There are collection of data suggesting that embodied cognition is important in human subjects. For example, experiencing physical warmth promotes interpersonal warmth. So the next time you ask your boss a favor, it is a good idea to hand a cup of hot coffee to him or her beforehand. A CV in a heavy boiler is perceived as more important if, if it contains exactly the same information. So next time you apply for a job, you know what to do, right? The sensory overflow is actually in a continuum with the body overflow. What do I mean? Now, suppose you're standing outside and looking at tree, house, car, and bird. You also have auditory overflow of birds singing, car make noise. Now, this sensory overflow is actually in a continuum with the body overflow, your tactile sensations, your body push your awareness, and so on. And it is the fact that these overflow do not enter cognition. You know, the majority of them do not end uh, cognition. So that in terms of the relationship with cognitive processes, the visual overflow or an auditory overflow, the sensory overflow in general, is in a continuum with the body overflow. Embodiment is about situatedness. It's about here and now. Whereas cognition is about memory, semantics, and intentionality. It is liberated from the here and now. So we have overflow and only a small part of it goes to cognition, but overflow is very tightly related to embodied cognition, so that when you experience such a thing, uh, it actually sustains the information processing related to emotion, posture, situated and context, status and context that uh, the most important elements of embodied cognition. And the phenomenology of our experience actually concerns it with here and now suspicious moment. Now, in the history of evolution, uh, the human brain has uh, evolved such functions like higher order thought, cognition, and language. These things are not existent in uh, the single cell organism. However, the embodiment has been there all the time. So it is a continuous evolutionary theme because every biological system is equipped with some form of body after all. So if you add metacognitive meta process to embodiment, I am arguing here that you get a phenomenological overflow. And it is concerned with the here and now. So it's no wonder they are not registered in the memory system. After all, the very nature of the phenomenological overflow is about here and now. It appears and then disappears. However, in terms of cognition, it does go beyond the here and now. Because cognition is a competition, right? It takes finite time. If you think the Turing machine, competition takes a finite amount of time. Well, for some competitions, it never stops, right? So in order to have competition or cognition, you need to go beyond the here and now. So that makes cognition different from the phenomenological overflow. Now, here it is useful to discuss the concept of vestigiality. Human ear is equipped with the so-called Darwin tubercle structure, which is a vestigial organ of the ear tube of our ancestors. Such a vestigial organ does not have a central functionality, but it, it can have remnant functionality, like the appendix. It no longer is involved in the digestive function, but it is involved in the immunological functions. There are vestigial reactions in humans. Uh, goose bump is a vestigial reaction. And um, palmar graft reflex is also 
a vestigial reaction. These reactions used to have functional significance, but they do not have functional significance anymore, but they remain. Another interesting concept is exaptation. Uh, take birds' feathers, for example. It originally evolved for heat control, then it was used for display, and then it was used for flight control. So these new functionalities is called exaptation, but at the same time, it is compatible with vestigiality too. So vestigial organs can have exaptation. Now, if you look at the history of the evolution of biological systems, a single cell had all the sensory data in parallel, and upon that, it evolved embodied cognition, right? And these processes would have been processed more or less unconsciously. Well, it depends on the definition of consciousness, but here, for the sake of argument, I'm assuming that these processes are unconscious. In the human brain, higher order cognition um, is supported in the prefrontal cortex, and this is conscious. And through the metacognitive processes, the embodied cognition becomes the phenomenological overflow. And then, since the central functionality has shifted to the prefrontal cortex, in terms of making judgments and taking appropriate actions, the phenomenological overflow has become a vestigial feature of human cognition. Or it can carry some exaptation features. So we have embodied cognition, and only a small part of it goes to higher order cognition. But through metacognitive processes, uh, part of the embodied cognition becomes phenomenological overflow, which is a vestigial phenomenology. Uh, because from the point of view of higher order cognition, it apparently does not uh, carry any functionality. But it is possible that uh, the phenomenological overflow can carry some exaptation, uh, some new functionalities. So we have embodiment and embod we have phenomenological overflow. A part of embodiment becomes phenomenological overflow, and together they are much larger in the information that they handle. In, than cognition. So E equal near, equals nearly equals or larger than P, uh, and which is much larger than C. And embodiment and phenomenological overflow is concerned with the here and now, the spacious moment. Whereas cognition, as I argued, because it's computation, it needs to go beyond here and now. So if you look at this scheme, it's no wonder that phenomenological overflow is not registered in general in the memory system, because it is the here and now, whereas competition um, in cognition should go beyond here and now. So the advantages of the vestigial theory of phenomenological overflow that I have uh, introduced here is one, it explains why the phenomenological overflow appears to have no functionality from the perspective of higher order cognition, and two, it puts the phenomenology of consciousness in an evolutionary continuous context. Conclusion. The phenomenological overflow is a vestigial aspect of embodiment brought into the phenomenological dimension through metacognition. This is my hypothesis. Thank you very much. And this talk with all the slides is available on YouTube. Search for Ken Mogi and Overflow.